Okay, guys, now let's start the class. Okay, so we continue with our second part of the first unit, which is legal theory. First is the distinction. We've already done this. Okay, you know these civil law versus common law systems. The real difference is the importance of judicial precedent, which is very high in the common law countries. Concentrate on the class, guys. Raghav. Concentrate. Harsha, come and sit on the first. Come and sit next to uh, Muskan. Come here. Okay. So, um, judicial, the, the importance of common law systems like what you have in India is the importance of uh, the importance of judicial precedent, which I think we've discussed briefly. Judicial precedent means precedent is obviously that it comes from before, right? It comes from the word precede, okay? So, um, therefore precedent and one thing i would suggest from a pronunciation point of view is that you can just get used to because there's sometimes people pronounce this as precedent which is not wrong on its own but then you get confused as in president of india president of the united states so what i would recommend is a good rule where this this word is pronounced as precedent so that you also get the connection to the idea of precedes okay and the president U us or president of india the, that you can say precedent so that would be precedent and this would be precedent okay so that helps you to uh, stay on track and so judicial precedent is basically a preceding uh, preceding judicial decision which is of a special type that is a type which has a pre uh, particular type of preceding judicial decision which has a particular Im influence on the current case it will affect the way the current case is going to be decided and it will determine the outcome so that's what is meant by judicial precedent generally will determine the outcome so that's what we mean we'll understand this so this is very important in common law systems which we already said is a mixed system because in common law systems uh, we follow both codified law and judicial precedent a pure common law system would only follow judicial precedent this is how the English law developed in the olden days because there was no codified law there was no Parliament in England because there was a king and the king basically set up the they set up roaming uh, circuits of judges who would go around the country and decide uh, disputes based on the customs and traditions of the common people so that's why the word common law and also the idea of one common law for the whole of England so that's where it came from there would there at that time there was only there was no codified law codified law means all these acts that you see contract act uh, transfer of property act all the acts that you see here these are all the acts now these are all called these would all be called codified law because these are codes enacted by Parliament which is a similar system that you see everywhere in the common law countries and also in the civil law countries okay so um, where are we this is we have to go here all right okay so um, so we have both codified law and judicial precedent both are important we'll see how they apply prospectively retrospectively that also we discussed okay remember there's a long discussion yesterday in the end of the class uh, the couple of questions asked by Mehul and uh, Monira uh, but there's a lot of lies in the background so those are also part of your syllabus okay anything that is explained to them is also you are expected to know at the end of the video yes Sir, they are codified because they have sections uh, not really because they are sections they are codified in the sense they are written into a code that's the main idea because in the early days of the common law system nothing was even written down it was just you know that the, there was a knowledge that this particular case was decided it's only after a few years that it started to get written down the decisions of the judges and even then what is written down is actually just the judgment there is no uh, principle that is being written down as such whereas in these codes if you look at if you look at any of these codes if you look at this say for instance transfer of property act which is again these are all british laws so if you see here you'll see the common law of england on transfer of property you can see how old this act is there have been some amendments but by and large it's the same okay so it has all these sections but it's codified in the sense that it's written into a code like in the early days you had the code of hammurabi and all that so it's a written down set of rules whereas in judicial decisions you are just noting down the decision you're not explicitly noting down a rule okay so that's why it's codified yeah. so it's a code so um, all right so this is what you have here so we've already discussed this stuff now hierarchy of courts I've told you to see the presentation in detail if you want to all right here and then uh, but generally we just understand everybody knows the Supreme Court high courts and district courts this kind of hierarchy so and this is also optional for you anything optional will be in italics so 
one, one new word that so the next doc, uh, module which, which we have is to understand this doctrine of judicial precedent very important which is the the word that you need to understand or remember is stare decisis this is pronounced as stare decisis which is a part of a longer latin phrase you don't need to memorize all this stuff but the basic idea here is again you don't have to memorize the words but to get the idea that is all we need we want you to just uh, conceptually understand the idea the stare decisis really means that if something has been decided don't disturb it okay don't disturb things that have already been decided this is the idea so the main idea here is that if you have a similar case when you see when we look at this uh, article that we will be reading the article by glanville williams we can actually refer to that now maybe we can make it a little smaller here is this still readable on the last bench can you still read the fonts okay so here if you look at this this article is in your notes you are required to read this article i'll help you along with the reading for most of the article i've also highlighted some important uh, parts this is kind of like a little bit of spoon feeding because we don't have that much time but ideally what you should be doing is you should develop the skill of trying to understand how to highlight the important parts when you're reading something how to highlight the important parts okay yukti don't talk Come and sit next to Saloni here. Let's split you up from your buddy. Who's your buddy, Kritika? Okay. Come and sit here. Okay. Talking is very distracting. I don't want to be distracted by anybody talking. If you're bored, you can sleep. That's all. Okay. So what is the what is the meaning of the doctrine of precedent here? This is the same thing as what we are calling the doctrine of judicial precedent. Okay. So a habit of following their previous decisions. Okay. That um, will come to ratio residente later. So the idea is that if it's a similar case, if you have a similar case, like there's a drunk driving case where somebody is driving drunk and he runs over a pedestrian and the pedestrian dies. Okay. So that's a similar case. This kind of case can happen once again later on. In this case, so, so the idea is that the previous case, however, the previous case was decided, the next case should also be decided in the same way. The idea here obviously is if we go back to our notes here, we see that this is basically the idea. So a previously decided case, don't disturb the uh, principle set down, laid down in that case. So the value of this, once again, you can connect it to uh, the principles that we studied with uh, when we were studying formalism. When I was uh, telling you why I prefer formalism, or you know why some other people prefer consistency, right? So the consistency point you can see here that if we follow this rule of stare decisis, that that which has already been decided before, if a matter has already been decided before, if a similar matter comes up later, then you should decide it in the same way, right? So you can see clearly that it will lead to consistency. Consistency. It is likely to foster consistency in, ju in judicial decision making. And can you also see the connection between consistency and certainty? That those who are subject to the law, like if I'm so subject to the law, if I know that, okay, up to five milligrams of alcohol in my blood is not considered to be a, a, a punishable offense if I'm driving with five milligrams of alcohol, then in that case, I have that certainty so I can act accordingly. Okay, and if I know the rule, so I need to know the rule from before. So this gives you certainty. So the people who are the subject, who are subject to the law, they will have certainty in the way they can conduct their, in the, the way they conduct their lives. Is this clear? So consistency of decision making leads to certainty, and certainty is a very important factor. And when you understand, because everything derives from uh, all the greatness of a country derives eventually from economic uh, prosperity. Without economic prosperity, it's hard to maintain uh, greatness, right? Like you have countries like North Korea and all which have been of course partly funded by China so they have a lot of military strength and they have some weapons and all that but it's not really a very strong foundation because they their economy is a disaster right so it, at the end of the day if you really want to be so so you see the enduring strength of the US part of that reason is because their economy is very strong okay the biggest economy in the world very prosperous and now you can see that they're adding more and more to their uh, military budget because partly because the economy is also going well so they can afford to do that okay so certainty type of business a good business environment is important and this is something else you need to understand as a business student that certainty is very important for business even if you're not going to take finance you should understand this principle that businesses require certainty in the regulatory environment this is a very important factor in uh, fostering what we call have you heard this expression animal spirits in macroeconomics have you heard ma animal spirits 
animal spirits is just basically it's a kind of like inspiration it's something like inspiration or um, you can I can just write this down you should write down this this is actually a quite you heard of canes since you're business students I'm just going in a little bit into it okay animal spirits is actually something that you really can't put your finger on but this is just like confidence okay confidence and uh, you know inspiration these kind of things so animal spirits is a quiet term that was coined by the English economist Keynes you might have heard of Keynes John Maynard Keynes okay so Keynes coined this idea of animal spirits what he's basically saying is something very intangible it's not like industrial production or total capital stock or total number Number of occupied housing occupied houses you can't put your finger on it but it is something intangible like business confidence okay do businessmen feel confident about making investments because everything is uncertain so you're going to take risk anyway do people feel comfortable taking risk okay so this this is the idea of animal spirits very important for business students to understand and be exposed to it so so what 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 the connection is that the uh, you know the, the regulatory environment the business uh, the legal environment if it fosters certainty okay it, it is very good for business it increases business confidence and it uh, generally fosters animal spirit so if you see how if you monitor this uh, transition from the Obama economy to the Trump economy one dramatic difference between Obama and Trump is that Obama because he was a slightly leftist leading president so he was over regulating the economy putting a lot of regulations you can't do this can't do that can't water your farm with this or that water you have to protect this fish and that fish so all kinds of regulations so what happened was that that had a very dampening effect on business confidence businesses were not sure what kind of regulation was coming down next whereas when Trump came in so there's a dramatic uh, difference between Obama and Trump on the point of regulatory uh, the approach to regulation whereas Trump's approach he already told people before that he was going to attack regulation like a maniac so he was he said for every regulation and what they have actually done in their administration so far is for every new regulation they have cut seven old regulations okay so and if you remove regulatory by regulatory the regulatory burden on businesses it automatically increases business confidence this is actually there's a lesson for this in our country also because our country also has the same problem that uh, we over regulate everything okay that's why business uh, activity is a little bit uh, you know it dampens the spirit so this is something which most governments don't seem to understand whether they're Congress or BJP the mindset is the same they over regulate so uh, so this is the idea that just uh, with a little bit of a departure from the law as such but this is a very important idea and since we found that you don't know important words like this animal spirits is basically business confidence and so certainty is very good for business okay so that's why uh, and since some Trump has clearly promised that I'm going to drastically keep on cutting regulations now he's cutting infrastructure regulations they used to take about 12 years to get a permit to build a highway in the US a bridge or a highway he has cut that down to two years now he wants to cut it down to one year later on and you see how aggressive he is in terms of cutting regulation and this will obviously have a huge impact on investment because the capital which was not willing to come in for a 12 year period of regulatory approval when it's a two year or one year that capital will come in so it'll have a huge impact on investment so this is what is meant by certainty so you can see the connection between the legal framework and the impact on the economy after all at the end of the day the economy is everything if you don't have a strong vibrant economy eventually you have nothing so this is the idea that the starry decisis helps to foster consistency and certainty that is very good for business so under starry decisis we will be studying two other concepts a uh, few other concepts first we start with vertical versus horizontal okay very simple stuff you need to refer back to the hierarchy of courts for this idea you remember the hierarchy supreme court high courts district courts so whenever a higher court is binding a lower court remember what starry decisis says that if a previous decision if there is already a previous decision on the same topic on the same controversy that you are deciding right now if there's a previous decision then you should follow that previous decision in whichever way the previous decision was uh, laid down or decided you should follow that same rule and decide it in exactly the same way so that you have predictability and consistency of decision making is this clear all right okay so yeah so lower court and higher court does not be the same no yeah it will be the same but the reason it is the same okay quiet please guys quiet so the reason it is the same is because the lower court is bound to act according to the decision of the higher court as you can see here we already have a principle in our we have a article in our constitution which is article 141 
which is it says here that the law declared by the Supreme Court is binding on all courts all right so what does this mean since the Supreme Court is top at the top at the apex of the pyramid the Supreme Court that all the high courts in this country are bound by the decisions of the Supreme Court so whenever Supreme Court has decided something uh, the high courts have to follow the that particular decision on a similar matter okay that's what it means so your answer is your point is correct but the more important point is to also understand why that ends up being the case the reason it becomes the case is because the lower court is bound to follow the decision of the higher court okay so the starry decisis principle only says that you should follow previous decisions and when we talk about vertical starry decisis we are talking I'm just coming to you yeah we're we talking about vertical starry decisis what we are saying is that this particular uh, the, the the subsequent decision is the same as the previous decision because a lower court is being bound by a higher court like a high court has been bound by a Supreme Court by the Supreme Court or a district court is being bound by the high high court decision under which so if a Madras district court district court under the Madras High Court is bound by a Madras High Court decision okay in that case we still have vertical starry decisis so you can see the connection to the hierarchy of courts okay one type of starry decisis is vertical Yes, Krish, what is the question? Uh, sir, if law gets amended, yeah. then how uh, lower court will, uh, lower court will uh, follow home? No, if the law is amended, then there's a generally the court will try to follow the amended law, or if they feel there is some con uh, confusion between the Supreme Court decision, uh, higher court decision, and the amendment of the law. So generally, they are supposed to follow. In the case of a conflict between in our common law jurisdiction, also because it's a, a it's a constitutional democracy, right? So you have parliament in that sense is supreme. So it should uh, the the codified law should have precedence. But there is any con if there is any confusion, they should refer it to a higher court or a higher bench or larger bench within the same court but generally they are expected to follow the codified law so if the law is amended then you follow the law rather than the precedent okay so if there's a conflict between the two you follow the codified law okay so vertical starry decisis now everybody understands these are just terms yeah okay quite quite yeah yeah there is a change yeah yeah no Telangana is it we are coming to that just wait for a while you will get your answer okay so okay quiet please there on in that row Mahima and all the people don't talk what is your you have a question about the topic then you ask me don't ask Vipul you ask me if you have a question you ask me okay I'm not penalizing anybody for asking questions have I penalized anyone for asking a question so you ask me okay so that way we avoid all these uh, <coughs> multiple soundtracks in the class because it's very disturbing for me I don't need I, I I don't want to hear any multiple soundtracks okay all right so uh, we are coming to Monira's question will get answered her question is whether Telangana is affected by Madras High Court decisions okay first understand horizontal starry decisis opposite of vertical where it's a court power of a court to bind itself so because we place such a high value on consistency what we are saying is even the Delhi High Court is bound by its own decisions all right so in general if the number of judges on the bench is the same which we call a coordinate bench or or higher okay so if you have a three judge bench on the delhi high court following uh, and they are faced with the decision of a either a three judge bench or a larger number of judges of the same high court they are required to follow that even if it's a smaller bench the still the default rule is they should try to follow the previous decision okay even if it's a single judge decision of the delhi high court that is being given to uh, uh, that is being presented before a three judge bench trying a new case all right which is supposed to be similar even then the default rule is try to follow the previous decision don't try to disturb remember starry decisis don't disturb what has already been decided so that is a pre preeminent rule but if you feel that the previous decision is wrong then you can change it okay it's not that you can never change it if you feel that a previous decision is wrong and you are actually a larger bench okay and one judge a single judge decision is felt to be wrong by a three judge bench they can change it okay yeah no, that's not really challenge in the sense see if it's a three judge bench uh, coming later after a single judge bench decision and they feel that the single judge decision is wrong then they can change it themselves okay but they should always try first to adhere to the previous decision 
position unless it's wrong in which case they can change it and if it's a challenge if it's like a coordinate bench like a three judge jet bench is facing a decision by a previous three judge bench as happened for instance in the supreme court on a very important arbitration case so supreme court three judge bench was facing a new decision on a similar point but the later three judge bench of the supreme court was faced with a previous decision by the supreme court also by three judges but the later judges felt that the previous decision was wrong so then they referred it to the chief justice for convening a larger bench because it's three versus three so the supreme court the chief justice would convene a larger bench to decide this controversy okay so that in that way it gets handled okay so uh, these are very clear now these points are very simple connected to the hierarchy of courts these are just we are combining this uh, vertical and uh, the, the doctrine of stare decisis with the uh, hierarchy of courts you can read this detail for yourself i'm not going to go through everything if you have a question you can ask me that okay then we have a other couple of points which are coming to the point that uh, monera raised there's a concept of a binding precedent versus a persuasive precedent okay so binding precedent can be of two types okay where uh, you either have so binding precedent is basically one where the court the current the later court is bound to follow the decision okay the precedent is the decision we refer to decisions as precedents or judgments or decisions or cases as precedents and they um, the later court is bound to follow that he is bound, bound to follow the precedent so that's why it's a binding precedent so it can either be a combination it can be a vertical a case of binding precedent and vertical stare decisis where you have a situation where the high court is bound by a decision of the supreme court in this case it is mo both a case of binding precedent and a case of vertical stare decisis are you following we're just combining the two concepts we studied is this clear if a high court is if a high court is let's say bound uh, a, bi a binding pre we are combining the two actually so we should put it um, here we can combine it this way when okay i'm just writing broken english here so that we don't waste too much time writing when how high court bound by sc this equals binding precedent so first i i discuss what is a binding precedent any precedent by which any court is bound is a binding precedent for that court now we are trying to just make it a little more complicated and combine it with a previous concept that you studied so it is a binding precedent and it is a case of vertical. yeah vertical stare decisis because both are in play here because the high court is being bound by the supreme court so therefore we say that it is a case of binding precedent and vertical stare decisis now it's clear mahima okay is this clear ragav concentrate on the class okay so um this is one okay the other is where we have when let's say when high court bound by its own decisions that will be what yeah so that will be binding precedent plus horizontal precedent okay so for instance if you have a, a clear cut case of a binding precedent by or let's say just let's say own decision okay so own decision if you want to make it very clear that it's binding we can say own decision where um there is a decision where the current bench is a three judge bench and they are let's say in, in the calcutta high court and they are being presented with a precedent which is also a calcutta high court decision by a seven judge bench in which case the three judge bench of the calcutta high court is bound by the seven judge bench decision of the calcutta high court so in this case we say it's a binding precedent but it is what kind of decision stare decisis horizontal right so we will copy horizontal from here and we make this actually we'll try to make this okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. The only difference is in the in the civil law jurisdictions, like say Germany, Italy, and all that, the importance of judicial precedent is not that much. They do follow, try to follow case laws, which they have started as a new. I mean, it's a new trend. But in general, the rule in civil law countries is the judge is not so bound by the previous decisions. The judge is really bound by the language of the code the statute okay like in france you in france you have the code of napoleon which is napoleon bonaparte uh, created this code okay so uh, this is basically it okay so these are clear now we have combined the two concepts all right what happened lots of talking going on in the class very disturbing okay from the next class i will be deducting marks whoever i see okay i don't have to hang everybody who has committed murder as long as the people i'm hanging have all committed murder okay <laughs> so i don't have to see everybody who has been who is talking okay so the the rule is very so the next class i'll have the rule set up because in this class i didn't punish the other class also but you should get into this habit so now you know under by now i think you understand that i don't tolerate any talking in the class there should be no sound at all if you have any question you have to ask me all right if you have any problem you want you want to uh, you want to take a water bottle or something you raise your hand it's just like an exam okay all right so uh, so this is the idea now you for you understand both this now we have to answer monira's question so by because we only started with a binding precedent okay we followed binding precedent and then we have combined it with vertical and horizontal starry decisis that's clear but we still have an address persuasive precedent now what she is talking about is let's say what happens if you have a if you are arguing a case in the hyderabad high court and you try and uh, you cite before that court you cite a decision on a similar matter by let's say the madras high court okay so in this case the hyderabad high court is not bound because they are on the same level okay so they are not bound by the madras high court decision or a delhi high court or calcutta high court decision in this case it is called a persuasive precedent in this case the madras high court decision that you are citing before let's say hyderabad high court or calcutta high court some other high court that would be called a persuasive precedent that particular case you are citing it is only a persuasive precedent it is not binding persuasive is in contrast to binding okay so persuasive means it is still open to the court in telangana to be uh, uh, or the tel court in hyderabad to be persuaded by the logic of the madras high court decision but they are not bound to follow it okay so it doesn't mean that it will they will never follow it if they are sufficiently impressed by the logic uh, uh, and they may still decide to follow the same uh, decision yeah but they are not bound to yeah yes krish so uh, we have seen that uh, people lower court, lower court uh, give a decision in a particular case, then higher court is bound to give the decision. According to the lower court, and Supreme Court is bound to give the decision according to the higher court. No, no. What is this? You are you, no. You are saying this. Are you asking me whether is this what I'm telling you, or you're I'm telling? telling you no, no, no. It's you're giving the reverse view. Actually, we are saying it operates from top to yeah. bottom. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, a, in a particular case, if a case gets started from a session court, yeah, and it go appeal uh, uh, Supreme Court, yeah, then it has been seen that uh, the uh, higher court gives decision according to the session court, and uh, Supreme Court gives decision according to the higher court. Yeah. That, uh, will it be called as a precedent uh, or a no no it's not a precedent in that case what is happening is that what Bhavesh was mentioning the word challenge earlier in this case what happens is when the session court uh, court of session gives a verdict in a criminal case then the person who loses in that verdict the person who loses that person may challenge the decision of the session court session court sessions court before the high court okay and then the high court can what the example you're giving is that the high court agrees with the sessions court and the high court says okay we agree with that decision which means they affirm the decision that is said to be affirm the decision okay they affirm the session court decision then if you are uh, able to get an appeal a certificate on appeal or you get a special leave petition you go to the supreme court on appeal they, they, they hear your case the supreme court may also decide to affirm the decision of the high court and the sessions court and that may happen in a particular case or they may decide to overrule okay so in this case there are multiple challenges to a decision at each level as you can see here the supreme court also in the case of these nirvaya convicts they lost once in the main decision but then they filed something called a curative petition 
you have a curative petition where you can try even after one petition and the Supreme Court has failed you try for a curative petition which they judges here in chambers and they may still decide to um, you know allow that petition and overturn which is what happened in that case if you remember this famous fire in that what's that area called that uh, in Delhi there was a very famous fire I remember I don't remember a lot of people died there was a theater there was a fire in a theater I remember I'm, hmm? I'm forgetting the name of the theater but anyway there was a fire in a theater Theater and a lot of people died and then the Supreme Court actually on in a curative petition they allowed those people they didn't put them in jail the owners of the theater were not put in jail right so I forget the name of the case so that happened in a curative petition even though they lost in the Supreme Court in the main hearing all right is this clear so far you understand now what we are talking about persuasive precedent also is clear now okay now this is a question which is raised in the Glanville Williams article also you have to read this article so the question that arises automatically is that if you are telling you that in the system of uh, judicial precedence stare decisis uh, in that case the previous judgment has to be followed but as you will see very soon judgments are very long okay so which part of the judgment has to be followed so here's the answer the answer is that it is only the ratio decidendi has to be followed not the arbiter dictum okay so we are teaching you two of these words these are the singulars ratio decidendi and arbiter dictum okay so the ratio decidendi will explain that and the plural is this okay These, this is the plural dicta again too much talking going on here what is happening who's talking ashita who's talking some noise i can hear a female voice somewhere in the background okay all right let's go to um, this okay so doctrine of precedent they've already explained this okay here this is what he's explaining what is the ratio decidendi this is the uh, part of the case that possesses authority okay which means that this is the part of the case so we are going to find out how to extract the ratio decidendi of the case and many of the assignments that you will have in your cp assignments in the class a uh, many very common question is going to be what is the ratio of this case right so we'll find out what the reason uh, ratio decidendi if you split it up loosely translated it is the reason for deciding or the logic for deciding so in ratio decidendi you have to understand uh, this is where your English comprehension will be tested where you have to understand you have to read the judgment and you have to figure out what is the logic that the court has used to come up with the decision okay to come up with the decision that it came to uh, what is the logic that it used okay so that's reason for deciding and it is the ratio decidendi of a case that is actually the binding precedent when we say it's binding on the lower courts on the subsequent courts uh, what is binding is only the ratio decidendi of the case and things which are not the part of the ratio decidendi we will refer to as arbiter okay arbiter dicta if there are more more than one so anything that is not part of the ratio decidendi would be considered arbiter okay not essential to the decision of the case other statements that they make okay so let's go and try to understand this article a little bit so this is very important as you will understand you'll find that the course maybe may seem a little bit difficult because it'll be done in the flip classroom style right now i am explaining stuff to you i'm kind of spoon feeding you later on when you start getting into your cp assignments you will be given a judgment and i won't explain anything you will have to read the judgment on your own and i'll give you questions you'll have to answer those questions and you'll be graded on your answers and after that i'll explain it to you so it's a little more much more intensive than normal uh, learning okay but it's it definitely is beneficial most of the batches initially they get a little bit uh, nervous but later on they find that it they, they actually like it so uh, so we are going to try that so you have to you have to develop the skill and the reason it's being taught like this is because i believe that instead of teaching business law in a very light form we have to teach it in a very int high intensity form so that you're actually trained to be able to take on even lawyers in argument because the training of lawyers in india is quite the, the there's a lot of variation in quality you don't know what you're going to get if you actually god forbid have to fight litigation on your own okay so um so this is basically the thing we've already discussed this this you know this paragraph you can understand what it means all right so we're going to try and figure out how to understand the ratio decidendi of a case is basically here i've just added so whenever i added stuff like this plus logic of how one leads to the other right because he has defined it as material facts of the case plus the decision thereon 
but actually I've just added just to make it very clear uh, that is which plus the logic of how the material facts lead to the decision of the case understanding that logic okay so he's given you an example here if facts B and C are material in a case and then you have a conclusion X if you have any other case in the future where facts B and C exist as material facts okay or where you have a B and C what he has not mentioned is here to be clear you should mention that if you have a B and C then a is immaterial just like in the previous case only B and C are material a may be present but it's not material okay in that case we'll understand what is a material fact so in that case the decision also has to be X it's the same way of uh, what we have already discussed okay with adding new concepts like material facts okay now we'll see what this means essentially uh, but then if you have a future case where you have a b c and d and d is also material then you can no longer say that the same conclusion x has to come has to come out as the conclusion because now you have an additional material fact which is d yeah so the the situation may the outcome may change because now you have earlier you had only b and c as material facts in the previous case so in the new case you have b c and d also as a material fact so now you can no longer say that x must be the conclusion okay it could be some other conclusion because of the name of the additional material fact that's basically it so question is what facts are legally material you can also use the word salient legally salient yeah yeah so we'll understand maybe once we understand material facts it will become a little bit clearer so the idea is material facts plus the decision on the case material facts of the case plus the decision of the case okay and as I said here just to be just to make it very clear plus the logic of how the material facts leads to the decisions okay analysis of the material facts leading to the decision what is the logic that takes you from here to there that is also I mean part of the ratio decidendi so okay so what we are saying is material facts if you have a case where there are the same material facts right then if you have a subsequent case where the material facts are being repeated and no additional material facts are present then the decision has to be the same okay I think once you understand what material facts are then it will become a little clearer okay so once you see here so you can hear you guys are familiar with this term called salient Yes, sir. salient features of the discussion okay prominent features or important features material critical features okay which characterize the discussion so that's what is really meant you can also use the expression legally salient all right so now in this case what you say he's talking about a situation where you have somebody being run down okay in this case the fact that the plaintiff plaintiff is the one who brings the action okay so if somebody runs me down and breaks my leg I will sue that person for damages and then I will be the plaintiff and he will be the defendant <coughs> in a civil case okay I'll give you these breakdowns as part of your notes later on but essentially that I'll be the play the plaintiff is the one who brings the action in a civil case and the defendant is the person against whom it is brought so the fact that the plaintiff had red hair and freckles and the name was Smith these are not material in a legal uh, from a legal perspective what matters is you have a human being who is being run down by a car so whether the person's name is Smith or Jane or whatever it is is not material whether they were wearing a blue shirt or they had red hair these are not material okay so uh, but they are obviously part of the facts of the case but they are not material so this is how you understand so here you would say the only thing that is material is that you have a human being who was crossing the street and is getting run down okay so that's how you try to understand material facts all right and then when you have the same material facts it should lead to the same decision so here what he's saying is that what is material in this kind of a situation somebody does this uh, driving negligently and uh, in consequence he injures the plaintiff like in Delhi you have the famous BMW driving case right which has been going on for many years that in, in consequence um, he injures the plaintiff so negligent driving is a material fact 
okay what color shirt the, the defendant was wearing that is also not relevant okay but the defendant is driving negligently that is what is relevant and in consequence he injures the plaintiff that is also irrelevant and then uh, through negligent driving so then you have a general principle that comes out of a decision like this that if you drive negligently and you injure some person then you will be liable under the law to pay damages right this is generally right so now you get some idea of what is meant by material facts all right those which have legal significance or legal salience okay so now they're looking at a particular case wilkinson v downton okay this is an old case as you can see but as you will see they they actually refer to even older cases and as you read the judgment so now from here onwards we are going into the judgment proper so when they write like this right j means right justice okay so it's justice right who is writing the opinion in this case so now you're reading the opinion in wilkinson v downton this is the case okay 1897 you can see this so these are the times when there was no codified law in england oh, this is queen's bench the qb is queen's bench so you have a queen's bench which is like a court like a high, a high court or supreme court so you had a queen's bench uh, decision on this matter and there's no codified law so the judge will evolve certain principles and give the decision right so what happens in this case is that uh, you can read the facts here so essentially a guy goes and scares uh, he wants to scare a woman and basically uh, enjoy seeing her getting scared so he tells her that your husband is in a car has been in a car accident and he's lying somewhere please go and fetch him okay so naturally uh, the woman after hearing this she goes into a nervous shock like she's in a panic she has a panic attack and she has this what we call in the law the expression here is nervous shock okay where she her nervous system is affected and it is all also obviously has physical uh, symptoms and so she's hospitalized medical treatment and all that so uh, then she eventually what she does is she sues the defendant okay so in this case the plaintiff is uh, wilkinson and defendant is downton so this is how cases are written okay when you look at the first uh, court of first instance where you first bring the action the way we write it if this is mrs wilkinson is the lady who is affected and downton is the guy who played the prank okay so the cases are always written like this that the plaintiff's name is first and downton's name is second okay but later on if downton goes on appeal to a higher court if downton loses in the lower court and he goes on appeal to the higher court then it will be written as downton versus wilkinson so in any court whoever's name appears first is the person who brought that action to that court okay and you have to also see what level is that court is it an appeal a court of first appeal or second appeal or whatever okay so you can see all this so the two questions in this case is that they have claimed for two types of damages or uh, compensation on two grounds one is that so we'll handle the smaller matter first and we'll see how uh, that is decided and you can see the application of judicial precedence so the, the the smaller matter they have claimed is a small amount okay i think one shilling something for because she sent a couple of people by train to go and fetch her husband so the rail fare for those two people she's claiming that also right and so that part what she's what the judge is saying is that part is very easy to decide because there's a previous case called pasley versus freeman in which this particular type of question was already decided so now you can see the application of judicial precedent can you see that yes, sir. that instead of having to re reinvent the wheel in this particular case to decide this question of the railway fares what this judge is saying is well we already have a similar issue decided and you can see how old pasley versus freeman is nearly uh 100 years before this case right so this common law in england started from the days of actually it started almost you know you heard of william the conqueror 1066 AD the Norman conquest of England okay so uh, William the Conqueror came in 1066 so this stuff already started within William the Conqueror and Henry the second which is the next uh, uh, third king after that so uh, this was already in place pretty much by the early 12th century AD the system was already there that you had a system of judges going around the country all over England deciding cases and their decisions were being uh, sort of recorded as the common law decisions and that's how the common law formed okay so you can see how the 1798 is already many years into the start of the system 
and many of these principles that you see in our laws also contract everything is written by the British contract act sale of goods act pretty much everything these are all uh, the codification of the common law principles evolved over hundreds of years in England okay all that the British did was in India they took those very same principles from the common law and they wrote it into a code like the contract act or the sale of goods act or transfer of property act so that's what happened so here what is happening is very old decision they see this and they straight away apply the precedent of Pasley versus Freeman because it deals with the same question of this kind of compensation for railway fares uh, in a similar situation so can you see one can you see one example of the advantage of uh, this judicial pre of using a system like starry decisis that doesn't lead to faster decision making or slower faster right because you don't have to reinvent the wheel when a previous when a same when the same issue has already been decided previously all you have to do is pull up that precedent and you can just back apply it straight away you don't have to go through the rigmarole of going through the logic once again right yeah it will increase the burden of in what way in what way no talking guys when one person i can't hear clearly what he's saying you have to maintain silence in the class you should understand this principle you have to maintain silence there should be no some multiple soundtracks coming through yes sir if the decision was taken according to the study decisions then how it will be challenged for the how you, you can always challenge it you can always challenge it but the point is that what we are trying to illustrate here is that this in wilkinson versus downton one particular question arises that is this lady entitled to compensation for the railway fares this question arises is one of the questions so what the judge is doing is he's applying this doctrine of stare decisis by taking a previous decision where a previous judgment passley versus freeman in which the same issue had come up and there the judges had decided that yes in this case you should get the compensation for the transport cost okay so what he's saying since this matter has already been decided before i don't need to go through the logic once again i will just see that the passley versus freeman the issue was the same that we are deciding now of transport costs in this kind of a situation so then i have to decide it in the same way i'm just going to apply that rule from passley versus freeman and decide the matter right you can always challenge this but in this case if you can show that the circumstances were the same in pasley versus freeman and in wilkinson versus downton then in that case you're not likely to succeed in the challenge because the stare decisis principle is being applied in the right way because the circumstances are the same and they have taken a previously decided case and applied the ruling in that case to this particular case which is how it should be done so if you want to challenge it, you have to show that the circumstances were not the same so that precedent was wrongly applied are you following the logic that is the only way you can challenge it yes yeah yeah what happens another lot of talking going on still should not see any uh, what is the problem muskan who's talking you're talking no talking i can hear a female voice in the background still murmuring yes uh, if a person is hired law to defend the case and he, the lawyer must know that it may be uh, just will take the decision of the decision of starting the cases yeah then he may uh, present it to uh, more uh, in the different way or in the same way yeah so i think what you if, if i understand you correctly what you're saying is that the lawyer who's arguing your case today he should he sh he should be able to or he will find some similar ca uh, cases which have been which have gone before dealing with similar facts and he will try to cite those cases in your case as well he, in the arguments for your case is that what you're saying in a different no if it's different then you don't cite it right? then you don't have an advantage in citing it you have to find cases which are the same which are talking about similar circumstances see if you are if you are arguing a case let's say for medical malpractice like like what happened to our famous bowler bs chandrashekar he was put in a wheelchair because of medical malpractice right so um, he is now in a wheelchair because the doctor didn't do the job properly he did not take proper care in performing the operation right so if he is suing for damages then he can't cite a previous decision on a bank robbery because the bank robbery and medical malpractice the circumstances are not the same 
right so you have to take so his lawyer would have to take previous decisions on questions of medical malpractice or medical negligence this is an important area of the law actually so there's well developed principles on many cases have been heard on these matters medical negligence so he has to find cases on medical negligence which are very similar to the facts of say Chandrasekhar's case and then he has to cite those in the court while he is arguing and then uh, hopefully the judges will agree and then they will decide accordingly of course he has to also pick cases which would be favorable for his client actually legal ethics requires the lawyer to submit both types of cases those which are favorable and those which are not okay on the same issue but generally lawyers don't bother they only submit cases which are favorable for their client not which are those which are against okay but this is an important point so this is one of, i'm just coming one of the reasons why i'm telling you to uh, learn this uh, study the uh, study the law in an intensive fashion even as john even if it's only one course because many times you'll find that lawyers are not even aware of the right precedence okay so uh, so therefore you have to be aware that okay you have to know how to search for precedents you should know that the right precedent you should understand what is the right precedent you should be able to read yes Jaffer, what is the question is your question answered properly okay yes suppose sir, we have a new case and it involves case length of two or three different cases okay again again noises are coming some yes so sir what would be the possible solution uh, the possible difference should include the solution of all the previous cases or it would be a new case no like, there, there is a case like there, there has been a case uh the abcd has a previous case tax and the new case which we are attending and in both abcd as well and efg of another case and what sort of decisions would be taken uh based upon two different cases happened before and same no no if uh, if your current case includes a b c d e f g as material facts yes, then just taking a case with a b c d doesn't help you yes sir you have to take a case with a b c d e f g yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, you have to find a case which has that unless those particular issues are so clearly separate so, that you can use one set of precedents for one issue as you can see here so, one particular issue is being decided by pasley versus freeman but they will see that the second issue is not being decided by pasley versus freeman so you can do that also depends on what kind of issues are actually involved so my concern was uh, will the city will suffer double penalty like abc has a jail imprisonment uh, no no there will be no double penalty i can already anticipate your question here because there is no double penalty because there are separate issues in this case you can see there are two claims if you are following this case in this case there are two claims one is the claim for uh, the medical the pain and suffering okay and the medical expenses okay those are connected claims one is one claim that is one claim and the second claim which is much smaller which is for railway fares so there are two separate issues here in this case mm -hmm. and the judge is able to separate them out and he's therefore using for the second one he's using pasley versus freeman as a precedent okay because it matches this clearly and in the next for the main issue if you see they are also citing pasley versus freeman that lawyer for wilkinson but the judge doesn't agree on that larger issue on the larger claim the judge judge doesn't agree that on the first claim of medical expenses and pain and suffering judge says that pasley versus freeman is not the right precedent for this this particular issue so it depends on the facts of the case if you can separate out the issues that is fine but in general if you can't separate out the issues you have to find a case which has the same material facts okay yeah all right okay so let's try and continue to understand this that um here what is happening is as you can see so this they have quickly decided so you see one advantage of the doctrine of precedent that cases can be decided very quickly or at least certain issues in the case can be decided very quickly the second part he comes to the first the major claim which is for illness and suffering here the lawyers suggest these two precedents pasty versus freeman and this versus this saying these are damages caused by fraud but the judge says no this is not matching the facts of this case these are not the judge says that in this particular case what she suffered illness and suffering it cannot be said to be due to fraud or deceit okay he's saying he's taking a different view on it so therefore these two will not apply for the first claim of the medical damages of the uh, suffering and the medical costs so he's going to have to decide this according to some other principles 
okay so he's going about doing that okay so what he's saying is the general principle that should apply over here is what what I've highlighted over here that Downton willfully did this okay Downton willfully did this he did something which was calculated to cause harm to Wilkinson right and in fact he therefore injured her right to personal safety and thereby caused physical harm and that that is basically the principle as you notice here for instance we'll see this later when we talk about substantive laws generally in a legal decision what is happening um, you two in the corner i think you you guys are talking now don't talk uh, while this whatever whatever i'm explaining okay so uh, what he's trying to do is he's trying to evolve a general principle according to which he's going to decide the main issue which is the damages claim for for injury for suffering and medical expenses okay so what he's saying is generally what he's saying is this guy intended to cause harm and cause physical harm and therefore see every person has a legal right to personal safety so he violated a right so this but this particular kind of thinking you should get used to that in the law you generally have a claim only when one of your rights is violated okay so later on when we see things like substantive laws versus procedural laws substantive laws what they do is they give you certain rights okay so we have marriage laws or you have contract law or property law everywhere the law is giving you certain rights and also imposing certain liabilities so when your rights are violated you can claim for damages that's basically how the system works that's why he's bringing in this idea that her light her right to safety was violated by the actions of the plaintiff and in fact physical harm was caused to her that would give a good cause of action this is an important expression also to understand cause of action so generally you understand the word infringement you understand infringement infringement means any kind of trespass or uh, you know uh, yeah trampling or any damaging the sense of damaging okay so we use infringement with respect to rights a lot we say that your rights were infringed okay so um, uh, right now um, so infringe her legal right so you can see the connection so in the law in general if you are making a claim before a court for damages or restoration or something like that uh, you have to show that one of your rights your legal right was violated or infringed and that only that gives you a call what we call a cause of action this is an expression that you should be familiar with because in the law we use the expression so if we say that you know it's like if I say that uh, I was walking by the street and Mehul came and made a face at me now there is no right to have nobody there's no right that I have that nobody should make a face at me so if he makes a face at me that's not a, a that's not a violation of my right so if I go to a court and say that you know I want to claim damages because he came and made a face at me so the court will throw it out because the court will say that there is no cause of action because no right of yours was violated okay so this is what we mean by cause of action that you have to show that some right was violated otherwise you do not have a cause of action before a court okay this is the idea so you should understand this also while studying this particular paragraph okay so um, so he's further de deriving further uh, you know working on the derivation of the ratio decidendi this part is important because you have to make sure that um, here okay guys what happened now Muskan once again you're talking to her this is what we have to avoid from the next class onwards I'm going to randomly deduct marks for people okay so now you know what has to be done no not a single word should come out of anybody's mouth it's not that difficult okay I've also been a student and I can sit in the class for one one and a half hours just paying attention to what the teachers even when I feel the teacher is not teaching particularly well or something I would sit there just practice this discipline it's not that difficult okay so you just have to practice the discipline you just you guys have got used to bad habits uh, talking in the class because in others normally in undergrad colleges people are not teachers are not that strict <coughs> I've seen situations where actually the teacher is teaching people are sitting in the back and chatting and there's a constant under uh, you know multiple soundtracks and those who want to listen to the teacher they also can't listen because with multiple soundtracks you get confused but the teacher doesn't say anything people are not strict 
so people get used to all this kind of indiscipline so here this will not work so you have to get used to being very very strict otherwise you sleep okay so what he's saying is try, he's trying to de develop the ratio decidentity they're trying to show you how it's developed okay so here what he's saying is remember what the judge said earlier willfully did an act the judge is trying to derive certain principles according to which he'll give the decision okay so he's saying that this guy downton he willfully did something now how do we know that he actually willfully did because you can't read anybody's mind you can't see what is in his mind you can't see what the intention is okay all right so what he's saying is that what the guy did by telling somebody a lie like this if you tell somebody that your husband is injured and legs are broken lying somewhere obviously the lady is going to go into a panic and it will cause some kind of anxiety to her and this may also have physical effects she may become sick because of a panic attack so therefore any normal person any reasonable person should have been able to foresee that if you say these kind of things to somebody they may actually have these kinds of consequences they may feel uh, they may suffer these kind of consequences so since the actions since the consequences of his actions were quite foreseeable to any reasonable person therefore we have to assume that this guy whatever he did it he whatever he did he did it intentionally okay so that's what the judge is basically saying because earlier he says willfully so now he's saying okay now how am i correct in saying that he did it willfully so he's saying yes i was correct because the consequences are, should have been pretty obvious to anybody therefore if he did it we can assume that uh, he did it willfully it's like if i take a gun and i pump 10 bullets into somebody's brain and then i say that oh i did not intend to kill him <laughs> that is kind of that is kind of stupid because you don't really know of course technically you don't know what my intention was but any person should understand that if you pump 10 bullets your person is going to die so that means from the actions that i took the consequences of my actions were so would have been should have been so obvious that we we can conclude that it was my intention to kill him right so that's what the judge is saying here all right yes yeah what happened any question okay what happened Kamiya is desperately looking at the clock so for the next class we'll have an alarm so that you don't have to look at the clock okay so intention to produce uh, you you know this word imputed imputed means you you ascribe the intention okay we say it is intention to produce such an effect must be imputed or ascribed we assume that he had this intention so we are imputing the intention to him although he has not explicitly declared it or we don't have an explicit uh, evidence of it but we are imputing the intention that means we are ascribing the intention to him based on his actions okay all right okay he is not citing an authority for this particular decision he is just deciding there's no particular authority for the first part of the claim which is the pain and suffering and the damages the pain and suffering and the medical expenses because this is what we call a case of first impression on this particular issue in 1897 there was no previous decision on the same issue so this is what we call when there's no decision on the same issue we call this a case of first impression which you can see here he's also written it here okay so so um, there is of course the ancient thought of battery battery you can understand you can maybe learn a little bit about some of these terms uh, battery which is when you actually have to hit somebody so these two words are used together assault and battery these are the ancient thoughts of assault and battery useful to know these assault is when you if I threaten to hit somebody when the person actually feels that I'm actually going to hit him so that is called assault when you're threatening to cause battery but when you actually hit somebody and physically hurt them that is called battery so these are old terms in the law assault and battery okay so he has just decided that this is not a case of assault or battery because he did not actually physically hurt her directly okay the physical harm she suffered was the coming through the uh, psychological uh, damage that she suffered so battery requires you to physically directly physically hurt somebody okay right so now you see how you extract the ratio decidentity okay which is by finding the material facts okay we'll try to go through some of the you have to read this article yourself also i don't i'm not going to go through everything okay
okay i think what we do is we go through you guys go through this article again on your own all right that uh, now one of the some of the things i i want to just talk to you about, i'll try and highlight some of the points here okay which is um ratio desert any you have to find the material facts okay you have the material facts these are irrelevant i'm not going to highlight that <coughs> Defendant, okay, this is something else you need to know. The defendant, if he loses the case, he is said to be liable. Many times I've seen students using language like in in the when they're deciding cases and then they're presenting on the cases. So you have to understand there is a right gives you an entitlement. What is the problem now, Garima? What are you? Who are you? What are you discussing? I, I mean. <laughs> okay rights rights lead to entitlements okay okay and liabilities liabilities are quite uh, obvious okay so very often what what people say the use of the language you have to be careful about the use of the language be quiet um, when somebody has a right restored to her in this particular case what happens is the judge determines that mrs wilkinson's rights were violated are you following she had a right to personal safety yes chinmay this kind of behavior will lose you points okay bhavya is sleeping don't disturb her okay so, <laughs> <laughs> no, if she's sleeping, there's no problem. You don't have to be embarrassed. Okay, we are just, I, I'm, I'm actually holding you out as a role model. It is better to be sleeping than to be talking. All right. So, um, so Bhavya has no liabilities. Only Garima and Chitmai have liabilities. Okay, so uh, in this case, now rights give you entitlements. So the way we should use the language is that mrs wilkinson's rights were violated her right to personal safety was violated by downton so therefore we would say that mrs wilkinson is entitled to damages very often what people will typically say is when the court and who has to pay the damages the defendant that is downton okay very often people use the language incorrectly by saying that downton is entitled to pay damages that is not how you should say it. Downton is liable to pay damages and Mrs. Wilkinson is entitled to the damages. Entitled to receive. Are you following? Let's write this down clearly so that you, you are not making. Now you understand rights and liabilities. So if everybody has a right to personal safety, then if I go and beat somebody up, then I am liable for violating their right to personal safety because I have infringed their right to personal safety. So in this case, I am liable for having infringed their right and the person whose right has been infringed is entitled to claim damages okay or entitled to receive damages so here we say rights lead to entitlement so here we say that wilkinson wilkinson is um, entitled to damages because her rights were violated okay she is entitled uh, to damages i can't see anything here uh, since her rights were uh, infringed okay and uh, downton downton is is liable to pay the damages or we say he has a liability to pay damages okay so in this case the spelling is wrong of downton but we ignore that downton is yeah is the defendant he is liable to pay damages okay so that is the basic idea. so please make sure that now that i've explained this to you nobody should make this mistake in the future 
that the person whose rights are violated he has an entitlement to receive damages and the person who has violated the rights he is held liable by the court and he has a liability to pay the damages this is clear the language should be very clear for the benefit of people getting restless okay so we'll give you because i've taken some one minute one minute before that before that now let me give you instructions please make sure that guys i'm not because i need to move a little quickly so uh please make sure that i because i want to get into the cases very quickly so with one more session max uh in the next session itself i want to get into contract law so uh please make sure you read the rest of the glanville williams article on your own all right and if you have any questions we can ask you and also uh, you can ask me and also let's uh, let's uh, let's read the rest of the read the rest of this unit one notes also on your own it's pretty clear okay all right so now you can i given you i've given you 24 seconds bonus okay